I want to take a moment to share something very important right now. Are you trying to figure out how to protect your savings from the banking collapse, which has already started, and the coming financial crisis? Most banks will fail. Deposits that are not insured by the FDIC will be lost, and there will be bank bail-ins. And this collapse in the banking system will lead to chaos in the financial system. Banks also provide loans to real estate investors. So what do you think is going to happen to lending in the event of a banking and a financial crisis? You can be proactive and position your savings to protect it and also have access to it to use it to buy discounted assets by positioning it in your own banking system through the infinite banking concept strategy. Producers Wealth has put together a presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com where you will learn how to position capital outside of the banking system and the Wall, Wall Street casino, just like the ultra-wealthy, to protect it and create a pool of tax-free liquid capital to capitalize on the massive opportunity to buy discounted assets, which is coming. You can access the presentation at yourownbankingsystem.com. That's yourownbankingsystem.com. The world is going through changes. Changes happening at a speed that we have never seen before. This is leading to disruption, chaos, panic, fear, hysteria, and a turbulent economy and marketplace. How do you protect your wealth in a turbulent world? How do you invest for cash flow and alternative assets to escape the rat race in times of uncertainty? How do you decentralize yourself, your family, your community, your business, and your investments to become sovereign and escape the matrix? If you are looking for strategies, tactics, and techniques to escape the rat race and matrix, you are in the right place. My name is MC Lobsher, and this is Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. I'm MC Lobcher. Thank you so much for joining me for another episode of the Cashflow Ninja and spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me. I've got a fantastic show for you today, but before we jump into that, everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. And just to give you an update of everything that's going on at CashflowNinja.com, uh, I have a book, The 21 Best Cashflow Niches, Creating Wealth in the Best Alternative Cashflow Investments. It's available at CashflowNinja.com. I also launched a newsletter, the Best Cashflow Niches newsletter, in which I share every single month a brand new, new researched uh, alternative cash flow uh, investing niche. You could sign up for the best cash flow niches newsletter at cashflowninja.com. And then, of course, my mastermind, Cashflow Nirvana, if you're a business owner or an investor that's looking to protect and build wealth during turbulent times, you can join a community of business owners and investors that's looking to do the exact same thing. You could go to cashflowninja.com and on the homepage, sign up for the mastermind. I've got a fantastic guest for you today, Max Wright. He's a returning guest at the Cashflow Ninja. You can go to cashflowninja.com and type in Max Wright and listen to the previous episode. He always provides a ton of value. Um, now, Max has been an incredible analyst and caller of crypto cycles and more specifically, uh, asset class cycles such as real estate and Bitcoin. He really nailed Bitcoin, uh, the law cycle, cold, cold, cold when it was going to start to, to start to go up and cold when it was about to bust. Um, so I'm really looking forward to getting his take on what's going on in the world and learning more about what he sees in the Bitcoin space. He's also uh, conducting uh, a webinar, which you can join at cashflowninja.com forward slash max, in which he shares the three phases of the coming collapse and which asset classes will skyrocket and which will get destroyed in each phase. Wouldn't that be something worth knowing about? Go to cashflowninja.com forward slash max 
and you will get access to that webinar. Not salesy at all. Very, very content rich. Highly recommend it. Um, Max, great to see you and welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. Yeah, yeah. Great, great to connect again. Um, for, for folks that are not familiar with you and what you do, can you please just share a little bit of your background um, and your journey and what you're up to these days? Uh, sure. I mean, I grew up in Australia, so uh, fun being on this podcast. People are used to the funny accents. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, grew up in Australia, like lovely middle class family. Um, parents are still alive. Awesome. Great. I've never uh, inherited anything. But so started from nothing except a wonderful, loving family and, uh, you know, basically retired by the time I was 30 and did that starting businesses, growing businesses, online businesses, um, eventually did a seven figure exit, uh, moved to the Caribbean and figured out I had all this cash that I needed to figure out how to invest. It just so happened to be 2012. And for the past 10 years, I was absolutely fascinated in monetary theory and central banking and fiat currencies. And so I was lucky enough to have a, a world of knowledge there that when someone explained Bitcoin to me. I was like, well, let me show off and tell you why that's not going to work and use my big fancy uh, economics brain here. And uh, it turned out a month into it, I'm like, oh my God, this thing's going to save the world. And so it basically became uh, devoted to uh, Bitcoin in very late 2012, probably early 2013. Um, and so, you know, ha I had a place to invest my money, which did very well. Continued um, buying and selling businesses, continued um, investing in real estate, or sorry, diversified into real estate. At one point, I had like 10 Airbnbs, I believe. I don't have any of those anymore. Um, continue with the online businesses, huge advocate of crypto and trying to save the world, uh, you know, one, one Bitcoin at a time. <laughs> Very nice. Now, we've, we've got quite an interesting kind of um, scenario playing out. Uh, a bunch of storms all coming together whether it's in the monetary system the de-dollarization whether it's the you know the the digital central bank uh currencies the cbdc's that, that are coming um whether it's the banking and the financial crisis which is which has started uh and gaining gaining some steam looks like it's gonna it's gonna really pop by by at least the, the fall and then i mean we've got so many other different things going on whether it's pandemics whether it's you know, the the uh, green agenda, whether it is immigration problems all over in the West, um, uh, countries literally being invaded. Um, talk to me about like some, what are you seeing out there right now? What should like business owners and investors be aware of? Because you, 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 you study cycles, you study economics, you've taken a look at all these things. What, what, how do you see the world currently? Yeah, it's very much, uh, if you don't feel like the frog in the boiling pot, then you're not paying attention because, yeah, this, the, the temperature has been turned up all over the place. And look, at some point it has to crescendo. Um, and, you know, I, I wish I could say it was going to be you know, on this date and, you know, you could write, you could, you know, make, stay invested in all of these things as they continue to go up and then just get out at the right minute. But that's very, very hard to do. And even the order in which um, these things that are going to take place, you know, is this commercial real estate going to go down before China invades Taiwan, before the next pandemic? Who knows the timing of things? It's very, very difficult. I made a video recently and I was talking about price predictions and I, I know you know, but for the guys who are at home here, I, I've been very, very successful in predicting um, the major booms and busts in the Bitcoin cycle. And yep. I tell people, it's like, you know, you know, during the, between two, when, from when it was, I got involved 2012 through to 2020, it was relatively easy to do. I, I felt like a guy in a, in a rowboat on a gentle stream with a gentle breeze at my back and, you know, figuring out where Bitcoin was going to be in you know, two years, three years, four years, five years was pretty darn easy, I have to say. Now, I feel like I'm in you know the middle of a storm. There's tsunami-sized waves. I'm in the middle of the Pacific Asia, Ocean. There's lightning strikes going on. And I can see the storms all around me. And someone's saying, well, where are we going to wash up? Are we going to wash up you know, in Japan or California or Australia or whatever? And I was like, dude, I don't know if the wind's going to be stronger than the waves or the lightning strike's going to split the boat in two. And we're going to... It's getting hard. So it's it's very, very hard to make really kind of timely predictions here. But I kind of come up with a formula to kind of navigate all of these things. I had to think very, very deeply about this because it is. There's just there's so many things everywhere. And what's going to happen first is who the hell knows? And everything's going to affect other asset classes a little bit differently. But I kind of came up with um, the Bitcoin bungee theory. And that's what I'm calling it. And it's basically the concept, no matter which crisis you want to look at, and we'll go and, we'll go and look at a, a you know, handful of crises in depth here in a second. But no matter which crisis I look at, 
basically it's all it's like it's everything is like an oh shit moment you know de-dollarization the BRICS nations are going to abandon the dollar of stones like okay oh shit moment what the hell does that mean for the world economy and basically that signals risk off it's like let's get out of real you know, things are going to get crazy we need to sell assets sit in cash be in a safe position and then there's probably some crazy times and we'll be able to jump back in and buy things for cheap later right so what that but what that means is there's like okay risk off assets assets go down stocks go down real estate goes down cryptocurrency goes down in the nominal price i'm talking about but then in depending on the crisis depending on the asset they might go down and stay down but there's something very interesting about bitcoin is that it's basically the solution to all of the problems and that's it even sounds ridiculous when i say that out loud i'm like am i like an evangelist am i is this is this become a religion for me because who the hell says something that's ridiculous as bitcoin solves all the problems in the universe it's, it's it seems ridiculous and yet when i go through and look at each of these things it's the, the solution i come to is basically that because the, the, the very high level problem of course is the central banking um well, i mean you can say it in one or two ways you can say government got too big it's just become a cancer on society. And that, what that breeds is it breeds corruption and it breeds is all the wrong kinds of people are making money. That's right. If you bribe officials, if you do rent seeking, if you, you know, capture those kinds of interests, now all of a sudden you can thwart your enemies. You can, you know, put up impossible hurdles for them. You can harass them with the IRS. You can do all these things and you can basically the, the worst members of, of society are getting way too much money. The people out there who are trying to be productive and, you know, build things and grow economies. Um, for the large part, if you know small, medium business getting absolutely slaughtered, if you can do it on a big scale, you know, yes, you can be a do a Facebook and yes, you can do some big thing that on the internet and you know become a billionaire. Absolutely, you can do those things. Um, but for the vast majority of people, it's a very, very tough headwind situation. And so you've got this environment where at the very, very high level, government got too big to cause all, all kinds of problems. The thing that allows governments to get big and the thing that feeds the whole thing is the um, the broken and corrupt monetary system. Uh, and that's fiat banking, that's, um, that, sorry, it's fiat currency and it's a fractional reserve banking. Yeah, add those two things together and it's the root of all of this situation. And so in an environment where some disaster happens, the price of all assets is going to get hit, you're going to go into a recession, whatever. But then there is a follow-up period and there's a realization that, oh, wow, well, Bitcoin is the solution. Me as an individual, what the hell can I do to protect myself from that calamity? On a lot of different levels, what can I do so that if you know there's a banking crisis and there's a bail-in like there was in Cyprus and my bank account just gets chopped in half, well, what could I do to have protected myself? I could have had some wealth in, in Bitcoin. There's a geopolitical crisis. You know, I'm in the Ukraine and Russia invades or I'm in Taiwan and China invades. And I was like, well, how do I escape this situation? How do I get my family to safety and take you know, more than the clothes on my back? You can't take your real estate, your stock certificates in your local businesses that are worthless. Good luck getting gold across a border. You're lucky to walk out with the clothes on your back, but you can have a phrase in your head, Bitcoin is your solution. And so we've kind of seen this already play out. The Bitcoin bungee solution. Um, we when when war broke out with uh, with Ukraine, we saw huge sell off in risk assets. Um, and it's funny that Bitcoin is called a risk asset, but a big part of the 2021 bubble was a whole bunch of people and Silicon Valley and things. It's like oh, this is a, it's, it's like the next tech. And so a lot of people who came in as tech investors. Now we're in the process of washing all of those out because they're just wrong. Right, the reason Bitcoin's price has gone down from 70 down to 15, now back up to 30, that was a process of washing out all of these risk on investors who think it's just another tech because it's not. It's not just another tech. It's something so much more important. It is actually a risk off asset is what it really is. It is your protection from all of this calamity. And so just like some of the people in Ukraine found out who realized they could get their wealth out of the country, um, you have this situation where the, the risk on asset people have been washed out the risk off asset people are starting to accumulate. And that's this accumulation period right now. And you get this situation where you have, like I started using the example before, Ukraine, war breaks out, risk off assets, sell off, prices go down. Then real world use cases of Bitcoin. It's like, oh my God, people are escaping Ukraine, Ukraine with money in their pocket, which they never could have done without Bitcoin. It's actually quite useful. People all over the world start thinking, oh, like maybe I need to store some of my wealth in Bitcoin. You had a follow up, you know, that, that happened within days. In the, in the weeks and months later, what happened? You know, Russians were having their football clubs stolen. They're having their yachts stolen. These are people, you know, they're just, they're just people. Their governments did something bad. 
And America just starts grabbing their private assets from private individuals who have committed no crime. The whole rest of the world looks at that and go, what if my country does something stupid and America is not happy? What? And so it's like, maybe I need your money in my bank account, but the assets that I own could be taken. And so what is something that I can take with me wherever I want, I have plausible deniability, it's in my head, it's decentralized, can't be stolen. I need some Bitcoin too. And it's this process, this, this Bitcoin bungee process where some new, some new calamity happens, price of most assets, including Bitcoin goes down and then Bitcoin responds very, very strongly. And so now with that model in mind, now we get to the situation of, uh, okay, so, okay, Max, now make some of your famous predictions. It's like, geez, which crisis is going to go first? How much <laughs> is it going to bungee down? How much is it going to go bungee up? In which yep. order does it happen? Do you get three, four, five hits of down, 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 down before you get some massive recoil? I'm like, dude, this is just getting hard. Or what I do know is all roads lead to Bitcoin. So if you just want to skate to where the puck will be, Bitcoin is where it's at. You know, you also have to live your life and you want a long road to, so, you know, I, I say so this right now, there's basically, basically just two assets in my portfolio, Bitcoin and cash, All right? If, if things go down or for a long extended period, it doesn't bungee back for a year, two years, three years, five years, whatever it is, I've got enough cash. I'm going to be fine. Um, but when it does bun bungee back, I'm going to be stupendously wealthy and I can take it with me anywhere in the world, no matter what country I'm in, no matter how things break down. I've got that as my backup and can take my wealth with me. So it's the it's the most liquid and the most portable thing that I know out there. So it's and just it's a very, very special asset class. I have something pretty exciting to share with you. I just launched my newsletter, the best cash flow niches newsletter, in which I share monthly one brand new uh well-researched alternative cash flow investing niche. As you know by now, after interviewing the best minds in business and investing, since 2016, I wrote a book in which I shared the best alternative cash flow investing opportunities that have been shared on my show. The book was called The 21 Best Cash Flow Niches. Well, since I launched the book in 2021, I have continued to interview incredible guests sharing incredible alternative cash flow investing opportunities. So I decided to uh, launch a newsletter in which I share monthly one brand new, well-researched alternative cash flow investing niche shared on my show. You can subscribe to my newsletter for the price of a coffee these days. Don't blame me, blame the Federal Reserve by going to cashflowninja.com forward slash best niches. That's cashflowninja.com forward slash best niches. Uh, another example I think uh, that we can add to that is we just recently saw that. So when the three banks went under, which two of them were crypto banks, right? Silvergate and Signature. So you mm -hmm. would think the knock-on effect would be, oh, crypto would just be completely demolished. And initially, yeah, I mean, the, initially there's a, there's a pullback, but then the bungee came in. And then um, we actually saw Bitcoin go up. And I mean, that was kind of the moment. I think there was, I felt just from looking, uh, standing on the outside and looking in, I felt like there's almost a philosophical kind of mindset shift happening when yeah. it comes to that. To your point, it was so speculative. It was so frothy. Everybody wants to get rich and buy into it. You have Super Bowl ads. You have, you know, Larry David from Curb Your Enthusiasm and all these folks um, with the, the crypto hoopla, and it was kind of different. Now it's kind of like people are seeing it, you know, and again, this is just kind of my observation is it's more like, no, this is just, it's it's money, you know, it's, and currencies fluctuate daily the same way that, 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 that Bitcoin does. And it was interesting to see what happened when the banks went under to Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, if, if ever there was a situation where, in the midst of a banking crisis, you would expect Bitcoin to suffer. It would be that banking crisis where the three biggest crypto banks were attacked. I would say attacked. Yep. I mean, it's a bit of a coincidence that the three banks that are crypto friendly banks and so yep. much of the industry got hit so hard. Um, and the fact that Bitcoin bungeed so quickly, I mean, within days uh, and so well, uh, you know, I think what got knocked from 20 down to 15 and then, you know, a month later it's up to 30. Like that was a, that was a, an impressive bungee. And it really gave me heart that a lot of people understand what's going on. And another component to the bungee is like, you got, we got to, we got to put the tinfoil hats on here big time because it gets into the conspiracy theory here. It's like 
definitely Bitcoin is a thorn in their side. I, I mentioned the concept of bail-ins just a, a minute ago here, like Cyprus yep. 2013. And I think I think uh, bail-ins were absolutely a part of their plan. And I think Bitcoin has taken it off the table for them. If they ever just chop people's bank accounts in half, I mean, it's you couldn't you would see Bitcoin go absolutely parabolic, and you could not get a better marketing thing for Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is already working; it is already doing its job. It is it is already starting to corner them. It has taken one of their really cool chips off the table. They really liked it after 2013, and they did it in Cyprus at the G20 meetings and things like that. They talked about it. They workshopped the ideas, and then they went all went home and they put it on the book. So it was on the laws. It was in the laws in all the different countries, including America, including Australia. It was, yep. it, they made the laws and they can do it whenever the hell they want. And I think Bitcoin has taken it off the table. I don't think they're going to use that anymore. Um, so that's like a really powerful message. But it's, it, as you say, it's a great, and we can go through crisis after crisis after crisis. You will find the Bitcoin bungee um, in operation. I think to your point, um, the a video that was leaked on from the FDIC meetings, I believe it was board members, lawyers, there were some bankers in there where the gentleman in this video is on all over the internet. It was on YouTube, but where they basically were, you know, to your point saying, uh, I think it was uh, last year that, oh yeah, well, balance. Yeah. yeah they're going to happen. They're, they're, they're going to happen. And then they were talking about how, you know, uh, the, I mean, really they were joking and this is behind closed doors where, oh, the public, well, we have to get the public to trust the banking system. And then they were kind of like chuckling and saying, well, you know, <laughs> So they shouldn't, but the, we, we should get them to, to kind of uh, do that. Um, you really are starting. I mean, I think people, if the first three and then the first Republic went under, I mean, you're starting to see all the small banks being gobbled up and the medium banks, all of them being eliminated because, you know, as the Bank for International Settlement said, there are too many banks. I think there's like 4,800 banking licenses in the United States. Like, how do you bring in a CBDC? With 4,800 ba banking licenses, it's almost impossible. You need yeah. to, to, to basically consolidate the entire banking system, have the Fed member banks remain, maybe a handful of others. I've heard like different numbers, whether it's three, whether it's 10, whether it's 15 and, and, and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, this, this definitely uh, then serves as a life raft. What is uh, some of the things that you're seeing, how they're coming off to that? Because, I mean, obviously this is on the table with... Um, you know, in my kind of worldview, I think the IRS is going to be used as a tool to go after a lot of crypto in investors, which we've always warned people to, you know, be be on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 you know, what 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 do you see from the attack vectors? Because it looks like they're coming from from that angle. Then there's also mm -hmm. legislation. Gary Gensler is on Capitol Hill constantly talking. What, what what do you see from the the kind of the the threat to it or the attack by governments? So remember, centralization is always their goal. And you kind of talked about that with the um, with the banking system. Let's I just I think it's important history there. So let me let's just yeah. uh, go back a little bit and understand this. So prior to the Great Depression, with you know the US uh, population at less than half of what it is now, there were 27,000 different banks in this country. 27,000 different ones. After the um, the Great Depression, it got chopped in almost in half. I think it went down to about 14,000. And it stayed there for quite a while, until about the 1980s and the savings alone crisis. And then that got whittled down. And right, we're down to around about 5,000 banking licenses now. And I think they're going to use this this next, we're going to see a lot more happen over the next uh, year or two. And they'll see them get whittled down. And it's just an opportunity for you know the little banks. I mean, they're attacking the little banks in a very, very clear way. You know, two clear ways they're doing it. Um, they're making, they're, they're deliberately making the consumer fearful of small banks because they say they told you outright janet yellen was said it right there in front of congress she said we will protect the big banks we cannot have a, a banking crisis at that scale but little banks we might not protect all of them because if you know just a few you know ten thousand customers lose all their money you know that's not gonna you know rock the system so we'll let those ones die and so she's what's that she's encouraging people to be a run on the bank of all small banks She's like telegraphing everyone, put your money in big banks, forcing there to be a run on banks and small banks and creating the crisis that she wants to see. Why does she want to see this, this crisis? Because her buddies and her team get to consolidate and buy up those little banks for pennies on the dollar, like happened to Credit Suisse, like happened with First Republic. And so, you know, this is part of the agenda that they're doing. They're going to continue that consolidation, which helps them bring in that CBDC. 
So understanding that long history is important because, you know, in every other industry, you know, there's generally, you know, there's, there's more shoe manufacturers than there were, you know, a hundred years ago. There are more, um, you know, restaurants. There are more, 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 more. As you double the population, you should double the amount of, of, um, uh, of, of competition in all the given markets. But wherever government gets involved in the, to help the consumer, they come in with an enormous amount of regulation, which destroys little business. It's targeted to destroy little businesses and grow the big businesses. And we're seeing that. So over the course of a century, you know, we're seeing that kind of consolidation in the banking industry. You'll see the same thing in healthcare. You'll see the same thing in defense. You'll see it everywhere where government has its fingerprints. The more the government's involved, the more the real economy, the small businesses is destroyed and you get the, the have-nots and the have yots that, that destruction of the middle class is always their agenda. Yeah, but, uh, I, I'm not sure if I answered your question properly there, but I thought that was an important place to go to. Yeah, it is. And it's and you brought up kind of the destruction of the middle class. It's sort of this Hunger Games society that that is that is evolving because, you know, what happened during, you know, 2020, even like from like from March 2020 and onwards, that whole operation, the COVID operation was to knock out small and medium businesses. They were the targets, your target, your uh, Walmart, your Home Depot, your cost, all of these huge stores, big box stores stayed open. All the small competitors were, were closed and they were the main beneficiaries along with Amazon. So it's almost like you're starting to see this now uh, in every single kind of like system that that's out there, whether it's the healthcare system, there's consolidation going on and there, whether it is the banking system, whether it is small and medium businesses and, and the banks, I mean, money is the lifeblood of an economy or currency. Let me refer, refer to it correctly. Currency is, um, and by kind of consolidating the banks now, who lends to small business and medium businesses? It's your smaller banks. It's your medium, your regional banks. They're the biggest lenders in the in the United States. You know, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase is a different customer than your small business uh, person just out in you know middle of uh, America. So that's, I mean, it's going to make it even harder for those folks. So alternative systems, alternative currencies. You know, Bitcoin is is again the the roads lead back there. Here's another interesting thing you brought up. The Great Depression. I was looking at this of community currencies. Catherine Orson Fitz talks about that as a solution. And there was over 3,000 community currencies just during the Great Depression in the United States. That's almost like, I don't know how many counties there are in the US, but th th there was a lot of those already. So in times of kind of distress, in times of chaos, in times when storms are coming to, you know, the storm clouds are breaking, the storm is there. It looks like that's kind of been a, uh, a kind of a life raw for folks. And now you have the a digital option. Yeah, it's, I mean, really, when I, when I discovered Bitcoin, the, the only reason I chose to learn about it was to tell the person who told me about it, why it wasn't going to work. Your silly magic internet money is not going to work. <laughs> and I just went deeper and deeper and deeper. And, and I, I knew my monetary history very, very well. And I was like, oh my God, this, this is, this, this, sol this solves humanity's biggest problem. Um, and the follow-on effects is just absolutely incredible. So it's it's something very very special. And I just can't I I can't conceive of a portfolio that doesn't have some exposure to Bitcoin. Like it is it is the get out of jail free card in so many instances. Um, so it just it has to be in everyone's portfolio. And we're doing a really good job of getting there. I, I'm very very impressed with its growth because it is such a paradigm shift. But we also have the best marketing team in the world in the um, Federal Reserve. So we got to congratulate them for doing a good job. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors, Penumbra Solutions. Life Settlements Investments have allowed financial and banking institutions to not only buy their equity contractually, but also diversify their capital from any economic, market, and geopolitical risk. It's been part of the billion-dollar blueprint followed by institutional investors. If you're an accredited investor, you can also now participate in this vehicle with enormous growth potential. You can watch an informational webinar presented by one of the premier organizations providing life settlement investments, Penumbra Solutions, at CashflowNinja.com forward slash life settlements. That's CashflowNinja.com forward slash life settlements. The password to access that webinar is penumbra, all lowercase. 
Yeah. So with the banking stuff now too, another thing that I wanted to bring up about that was what was it like Hank Paulson had to go to Congress in the U S and beg for like 700 billion in 2008. And then Jamie Dimon of JP Morgan Chase comes out and this backstop, cause you're not allowed to call it a bailout anymore. Uh, it's rebranded. It's remarketed. It's not a bailout. It's a backstop. We're just going to mm-hmm. backstop all the big banks. Mm-hmm. And then uh, he comes out and nonchalantly kind of says, oh, well, you know, it's probably going to be like 2.3 trillion, which I didn't even have to go to Congress for. So th- you, I mean, this will have kind of an, initially an inflationary effect too, but I just wanted to bring it in that you're saying is because a lot of folks think, you see all the marketing in the alternative asset space to doomsday, you know, Mad Max waking up, you know, or hyperinflation. We see all all those kind of ads. It, I mean, you're going to have a little bit of both, right? What What do you see with that? You're going to have everybody that's gone to a store knows inflation's rampant, but there are these shock uh, effects that these crises will bring. That'll be very initially very deflationary, right? And then you'll have the the bungee cord. Yeah, this is correct. And this, this like, so it's very important to know that the 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 cartel, the banking cartel that profits from the system, they profit in two main ways. They they, they profit when they get to print money, of course. I think most people understand that. But what most people don't understand is another big chunk, maybe even bigger portion of their profit, is in creating the the boom bust cycle. So they did it in the Great Depression as well. Uh, they're doing the exact same thing now as they did then is they're restricting the lending. So the governments can turn on the, the, the taps and print money, right? Most people know that part. What m- most people don't know is that 90% of money creation happens at the commercial banks, not the Federal Reserves. So the Federal Reserves increases a portion of the money, right? But then the banks then to get to use fractional reserve banking that money that money initially goes to the banks and now they are able to um, lend out money it's significantly more money for the bank if the federal reserve prints a, a billion then the commercial banks collectively get to go you know somewhere in the order of 10 to 50 billion dollars right and that is new money created so the vast majority of money creation happens at the commercial banks when they say and they're all very public about it they say we're a little bit scared about the economy. Uh, you know, things like things might get. We're going to restrict our lending practices. We're going to have tighter uh, lending practices. Instead of lending ninety percent on real estate to anyone with a six hundred FICO score, we're going to lend eighty percent to only people with over a seven fifty, or all these kinds of things. Right? That way more than money printing at the Fed dramatically reduces the money supply, and it's extremely deflationary. Because people just the, the 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 amount of money there to buy up purchases and keep buy, um, keep things high is just not there, and so as a result, the price of assets gets absolutely clobbered. Real estate, stocks, you name it, and then the banks they get to come in, hand them off to their friends, put things in their own name. They get to scoop up all of the assets for pennies on the dollar after the crash happens that they created. Right, and that is just as big a profit center as the money printing or, that it, they originally did. So they cause these booms and busts. They like these booms and busts, um, and they make their money when they get to get First Republic for pennies on the dollar. When they get to get your house for pennies on the dollar. Like I know, I uh, had a buddy who actually went and did the um, when and looked at the tax records on the uh, in the, and in the Tampa area. We were talking about that earlier. In the Tampa area, there was a whole bunch of. Um, properties went into foreclosure in 2008. If the banks put them up to like auction, like like go through the normal process, yep. then it would have caused a much bigger problem because then there would have been all of these listed transactions and sales that happened um, and the price gets way down. Now everything else is upside down and it becomes a snowball. It's a big disaster. So there's wisdom to it, but they planned for this. So there's, there's evil to it as well. There, there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of just single uh, single family homes that went to Berkshire Hathaway for $1,000. I mean, these were things that were worth $100,000 in you know, 2006, were probably worth about $30,000 in you know, 2008, eight nine, and he got hundreds of them for $1,000. And it's just handed off to your friends and that money comes back to you know in the bribes in some other ways, things like that. But you can actually go and see the tax records of these properties being handed off in, in hundreds at a time for $1,000 each. Uh, and those things were renting for $1,300 a month. You know, so it's just, it's obscene um, that these things happen, but this is the nature of the corrupt system. So 
that's where we're at. And if you look at how folks are preparing, it was even in the news. I think uh, Zero Hedge covered Buffett yesterday, not you know, big in cash, one of his biggest cash positions again, uh, just mm. as you mentioned, Berkshire Hathaway. And then uh, I believe it was Blackstone that now put together another fund to buy distressed real estate. They're not letting a lot of folks out of their fund for commercial, <laughs> commercial real estate, but they're putting together another fund. So as the one fund, they're trying to... Um, trying to uh, hold on to that they put together they're they're preparing for this because that was going to be my next question uh you've been a realist a long time real estate investor like you know with all these storms coming together what does that look like housing is very i mean the u.s is huge uh lots of different markets and so forth but what does that look like and then also uh some comments on the commercial real estate crash that, which have started the media just hasn't told people for uh, everybody right yeah, commercial real estate is in all kinds of trouble. Or oh, definitely, that's already started. I mean, in, so we'll, we'll, obviously it's market by market segment, but we'll just speak at high levels here and speak in generalities. Yeah, residential is certainly um, taking a hit. Um, and people, it's important for people to understand, go back and look. People don't think about this, but in, two, in the 2008 crisis, as we call it, the peak in real estate prices was 2006. Yeah, it was a good solid 18 months later from when the peak happened to when actually it was the oh shit moment where everything just absolutely falls apart. Um, and so, you know, we are pretty close. Actually, I've got my, uh, if, uh, I won't show it to you, but uh, I've, I'm looking at the case Shiller thing here. And we are now about 10 months into that beginning of that process, right? And it's very important to know um, that case Shiller index is just like, a, it's a good rule of thumb to, to use as a proxy for a real estate market. It's about three months in arrears. So, so we are, we know just first thing I just you just look on Zillow, it's just like price drop, price drop, price drop, price drop. We know there's another three months there. So we're already 12 months into this kind of crisis. And so it's, we're not long. A lot of people are predicting, you know, recession here at the end of this year. Uh, I think it's going to happen either at the end of this year or next year. Um, and it's, it's, it's real estate's going to get hit, but here's the thing. And this is where just all bets are off. They can't let it crash, crash. You know, they can, Choose to let it go a long way, and they can they'll they'll do it in such a way. Remember, these guys are always making decisions to serve them and not you, and so they'll let it go. They'll let the real estate market, real estate market go a long way down. They get to scoop up pennies on the dollar, foreclose on people, steal their homes, et cetera, et cetera, to a point. But there is a point where it completely breaks the entire system and everything, then they then they lose the goose that lays the golden egg. They lose the Federal Reserve. They lose the banking system. They lose all of it. And so there is a point where we all know they will jump back in and bail out, just like you talked about in 2008 happened. That's absolutely going to happen. And we know these things are always exponential. So they have to get bigger. Right now, I think the Federal Reserve balance sheet sits at around $9 trillion. You know, at the Before the, in 2006, I think it was less, less than a trillion. Um, and then after, I think after 2008, it grew to about $4 trillion. Uh, Now this jumped up. At the time, it was the biggest expansion of the Fed balance sheet. Now, you know, COVID was the next biggest one. And this next crisis is going to be even bigger again. And so I wouldn't be surprised by the end of this decade, the, the Federal Reserve balance sheet's in the order of $25 trillion. That is an enormous amount of money printing that needs to happen. And that's just, it leads to inflation, of course. Um, and then they'll use inflation as an excuse to crash the economy again. It's such a ridiculous strategy. It's like, I heard someone say the other day, and I thought it was quite a good analogy. It's like, um, if you've got termites in your house, and taking a blowtorch to the house to kill the termites is basically what you're doing. It's like, oh, we've got inflation caused by money printing. I know what we'll do. We'll just cause a recession so that we'll take all the money off as many people as possible, jack interest rates up so no one can afford anything and cripple the economy. And then we'll have inflation under control. But they still got to print the money. They still get to buy up all the assets. And now they just buy them up for even cheaper. So very, very, I mean, it just, I mean, you have to either, either laugh or cry because it's such a broken and corrupt system. And I think I said at the top of the show, the problem is government has just gotten too big. Yep. And when government gets that big, you can't not have exorbitant levels of corruption, rent seeking, insider play, and all the things that go along with it. And when you have a, a, an economy that is that corrupt, the productive people can't hold up the non-productive rent seekers for that much longer. And you get, you know, this is why socialism and communism always collapses. The productive people can't hold up and support all the unproductive people who are the rich ones who are rent seeking. It just doesn't work. 
and eventually it collapses. I want to take a moment to recognize one of our sponsors. My friend Dave Zook says, you can be conventional or you can be wealthy. Pick one. At The Real Asset Investor, Dave and his team bring their investors high-yield investment opportunities across several asset classes for cash flow, tax impact, and equity growth. He and his team are one of the top five ATM operators in the country, and they have an investment opportunity available to accredited investors right now in the ATM space. To learn more about their ATM funds that produce tax-free cash flow, visit therealassetinvestor.com. That's therealassetinvestor.com. What's very interesting too is we haven't even brought up the AI kind of effect on the economy, which seems to be in turning like just into exponential phase. Every week, it just gets turned up. So I was looking at that the other day and um, just reading and doing research. I mean, the first time I looked at this, you know, obviously you get it. Your your first response is, wow, I could utilize this and I can le leverage this and kind of a, a, a bring this into my business and, you know, um, have be so much more productive and, and so forth. And then the second thought is, oh, wow, this is going to basically take and knock out 80% of jobs <laughs> right now in in this economy and, and that's not even factored in so you got all these things going on you got ai replacing i mean that's why if you look at the layoffs it started at the tech companies right mm -hmm. the big tech companies and it's now seeming to make its way through it and it's not surprising i know there's a lot of theories behind it it's not surprising uh that media companies are now laying off they're either going under or they're laying off so many people because you can now have a chat GPT write your, you know, <laughs> vice art article for you with all the talking points that you want to get in. You don't need a human anymore. So it's interesting to see that it's already like filtering. I mean, it's already, I don't think people fully grasp that yet, but all these people getting laid off. Yes, there's not a lot of eyeballs on them anymore. Nobody trusts them. But it's also you got to look at from the AI angle, right? So the, this is a really, this is the only counterweight I can see too. We could go through like a dozen like calamities that are absolutely on the surface about to cause a crash, which will cause money printing, which will do all that. There's yeah. one thing, one saving grace on there because historically inflation is the thing that unwinds this. Like, the, the, you know, you know, like, you know, it took Rome like 400 years of, you know, poor financial management before eventually it collapsed through inflation, right? Inflation is the, is the final death nail in the coffin. But AI and a huge, a huge leap forward, um, sorry, a huge productive leap forward is the only thing that could possibly kick the can down the road at this point. Once the inflation hits, which we're in the middle of it for sure, um, then the only thing that kind of reverses it is a massive increase in productivity. And for the people, for, so understand that when people think about that inflation number, a really good way to think of it is it's just a ratio, total amount of money in the world total amount of goods and services that that money is chasing. Lots more money, they bid up the price of goods and services. Reduce that money, you know, they can't bid up the price, you get deflation, right? It's actually a ratio between goods and services and money. If there is a massive skyrocket in productivity so that human beings are creating double the amount of goods, it's actually extremely deflationary. Well, it, but now that will never happen. I want to be crystal clear on that. They will always print the money to absorb all of that. And so they'll steal the wealth. What should happen in a fair and just economy? These incredible things like this AI and all this stuff. You say, well, it could mean that like 80% job layoffs. Yes, but it should also lead to an 80% drop in the cost of living. Yep. In order to, you know, if you have to, if you fight, get to fire 80% of your workforce, you're still producing the same amount of goods or more. What that means is co the competition should mean the cost of those goods go down. And what happens is those people who are now unemployed, when their cost of living goes down by 80%, they can pick up a little bit of work here and there and, and things are going to work out actually pretty good. Like life gets better with technology in, in introductions. However, at the same time, you've got these guys stealing the value of all of that, of all of that productivity increase and the productivity goes up through inflation. But certainly there'll be uh, hits and jolts and things that go back and forward. And there'll, there'll be, you know, which one's going to have the most powerful effect um, is the money print. The, I, I think what's going to happen is, you know, recession will hit, Money printing will go crazy. Um, and that, that'll be more of a jarring quick thing. 
this AI thing, I think we're at like at a hockey stick moment, but it is going to change. Instead of productivity increasing at like something along the lines of 2% per year, I think we might see a jolt here. And now all of a sudden productivity might start increasing at 3, 4, 5% a year, and it will change trajectory. But it will still take many decades to play out, I think. Um, and so the bigger, it has the potential to solve a lot of problems. Unfortunately, the corrupt system, the money printing is going to steal all of the value that it would have brought. And it's going to do so quickly and in advance. So we never even get to feel the benefits of, of those kinds of things. Yeah. And, and to, it's like the internet, right? Where it created so many incredible opportunities and jobs and connected the world and so forth. It's just interesting, the timing of it, where, you know, if I put my tinfoil sombrero on, I'm like, it's part of like resetting kind of the new economy in a, in a way, um, which is, which is interesting. So a, a very, very core thing here that I picked up from you from solutions and uh, is decentralization. We have systems that are in the process of collapsing. Mm -hmm. And at this point, I mean, it's going to be very tough to stop them from collapsing. It's, you know, what's the, um, there's a term that was brought up the other day. It, you know, people talk about a controlled demolition, managed decline. That's the new mainstream media word. It's a managed decline. I'm, I'm like, you mean like a controlled demolition? No, 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 no. It's a managed decline. <laughs> yeah. But um, so decentralization is a huge kind of solution to this. What are some of the things that we could leave our uh, listeners and our viewers with from a solution base stuff in all areas, right? So um, you, um, you've got access to um, land in, in, in middle of America. There's access to food, that kind of stuff. What are some practical things that folks can do to make them, you know, just less dependent on, uh, you know, some of these systems that are collapsing? Yeah, I mean, this is where you go. If you want to go to the nth degree, you go full prepper mode. But there's a lot of different categories to do this, ways to do this, and means to do this. Um, I, I'm in a wealth position and I've structured myself in a way where I might get my wealth, I can teleport it anywhere in the world. I can go to where the food is, to where the sunshine is, to where the freedom is, all right? I can do that. Not everyone can do that. Um, and they don't have the, the, the wealth and the, 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 the wherewithal to do that. And so for them, they need to think about things like food and weapons and staying in place and community around them. And those things are all very, very valid and very, very sensible things to do. Um, but there's different different scales to which you should do this. So. But yeah. as you said, decentralization is the, the solution to this. Making yourself powerful, making yourself valuable is meaning you're going to have a lot of networks. You're going to have a lot of people that you can rely on who are, because they rely on you. And so improving your skills, improving your resources, you know, I'm a, I'm a huge advocate of getting rich. Like get rich. It's really, really, really important. Get rich because like in the Great Depression, for example, you know, when People are like throwing themselves off buildings or it's like, you know, we'll work for food, we're on the sandwich boards. You have to understand that was the bottom 30, 40% of the country. And it's horrible to see that still 60% of people doing all right. You know, yep. make sure you're in that 60%. So there's a lot of ways to, um, to work hard and get to that level. Um, but I would say the thing that all everybody can do for sure is understand cryptocurrency, know how to secure it, know how to store it safely and have a portion of your wealth in Bitcoin. It's going to be the currency of the black market. And as you know, centralization and government, desperate governments do desperate things. So they start doing things like outlawing gold, like they do in the, in the Great Depression. They'll do all these kinds of things. And what will, uh, what will um, spring up is a bigger black market. You might need to bribe bureaucrats. You might need to get your food. You might need to um, do all kinds of things to, to get the basics of life. And the black market just springs up. And the, I think Bitcoin will be the currency of the black market. And the more the more they tighten their grip, to quote uh, Princess Leia, um, the more star systems will slip through their fingers, meaning the more controlling they get, the bigger the black market gets. And yep. so having, having the currency of the black market is going to be a very, very important thing. So financially, that's what you can do. And then you work hard to become resilient, both in your skill set and your resources. If you have some food, have some guns, have some ammo, have some skills, you're going to be valuable and you're going to be just fine. Yeah. Um, there's already communities. It's It's been fascinating to see that there's already communities that are springing up and folks that are, you know, quote unquote, uh, I mean, this is the future of black markets, but they're like, we will accept crypto for the food that we grow and 
the meat and and so forth and we'll ship it and there's already people you know bartering so it, it's it's very it's fascinating to see this stuff already starting to spring up so this is great max where can you just um released a webinar that you're hosting um where can folks watch that and also where can they uh follow you where can they stay in touch and reach out and and where can they stay informed of all of the many projects that you're involved with Sure. You know, I just, yeah, so I just completed a webinar um, and I go through a, a lot of these. It's very content rich. I'm, I, I know when most people watch webinars, you have to sit through the first half an hour of the person showing in their pitch at their trips of a, or a vacation to Europe to prove how important they are. <laughs> I don't do that. It drives me absolutely insane. I just go straight to the content and I just literally lay out different plans for people um, and give people the exact formula for how everything is going to play out. Um, so to watch that, there's no easy way. I'll, I'll send you a link. Um, and if you, I'm assuming there's a place in the description or something, you can put the link to that. Yep. So I'll send you the link for that. But then if you want to stay tuned, um, I'm known as contrarian dude on YouTube. So if you just go to YouTube and look for contrarian dude, you should see me, um, Max Wright will pop up. Search for uh, contrarian dude, Max Wright YouTube, and you'll see my channel there. Uh, and you can go ahead and subscribe. And that's a great way to keep in contact with me. Awesome. And for folks listening, I'll just put it at cashflowninja.com forward slash Max. So yeah. cashflowninja.com forward slash max. And then, um, yeah, the, the last video you did, I remember this. This is a couple of years ago, but you called that that Bitcoin rally. Like, I mean, it is like, I still remember it. And I, I'm like, I saw that you doing the presentation and looking at what Bitcoin was going to do in the next 12 to, to 18 months. And I, I mean, literally, it was uh, <laughs> it was very well called history before it happened. So make sure you check out that webinar, cashflowninja.com forward slash max. Thank you. So I just updated. I do this fun thing kind of every year or two. I call it my Inception video. And if you're familiar with the movie Inception, yep. it's a dream within a dream within a dream. So what I go do, what I do with the, my Inception video is I go through and show. It's like, hey, here's this video on YouTube. Here's the date. Here's what I said. I click play that it was, and it's just like a video and a video and a video. I go through all my his, my past calls. And I honestly, I kid you not, I'm just, I just I shock myself when I go through and I make those videos. I'm just like, oh my god, dang, I was. I picked that like a dirty nose. How did that happen? <laughs> yep. And it's uh, they're, they're they're really fun videos, and I just kind of uh, updated that one too. So that's a fun one to watch. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for coming back on the show and connecting and uh, just sharing your knowledge and providing so much value for all my listeners and my viewers. This has been a blast. Uh, thank you so much. Happy to do it. And thank you to you, the listeners and the viewers, for spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me at the Cashflow Ninja. Uh, appreciate every single one of you. Everything Cashflow Ninja is at CashflowNinja.com. CashflowNinja.com. You could go to CashflowNinja.com on the homepage and purchase a copy of my book, The 21 Best Cash Flow Niches, Creating Wealth and the Best Alternative Cash Flow Investments. You can subscribe to my newsletter, The Best Cash Flow Niches newsletter at CashflowNinja.com. In this newsletter, you will get every single month a well-researched new alternative cash flow niche. And you can join my mastermind at CashflowNinja.com. It's called Cashflow Nirvana. If you're a business owner, or an investor that's looking to protect and build wealth during turbulent times, you can join a community of business owners and investors that's doing the exact same thing. Until next time, live infinitely. This presentation is for educational and informational purposes only. The information being presented and considered does not consider your particular financial objectives or situation, and it does not make personalized recommendations. This material is not intended to replace the advice of a qualified tax and legal advisor or other qualified professionals. And you should not use the information in place of a customized consultation with a licensed professional regarding your specific personal financial objectives, situation, and needs. We believe the information provided is reliable, but we do not guarantee its accuracy, timeliness, or completeness.